Hi everybody. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm still here at Morita Valley College. Um, been here all morning and day. <laughs> <laughs> also, Zoom meeting all day. Okay, let's check out the lab for a few minutes and then we'll get started. We're going to do lab three today. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Not bad and yourself? I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> As I was saying, I'm still here at Moreno Valley College. Probably going to leave after your class. Just uh, catching up with grading and meetings. So. Okay, so let's check out lab three. I wanted to kind of do a little bit of lecture before we get started, okay? Um, so two minutes, we'll get started. We'll talk about instruction for a few minutes and then I'll help you get set up for your lab. Stop sharing. Let me double check my canvas here. So your assignments have been graded if you have submitted it uh, yesterday. And then if you turn in something today, I'll try to catch up tonight. I also disabled the missing zero grade. I don't know how effective it is. They change our grade book in Canvas. So I don't usually enable that, but for some reason it was enabled when I brought in the Canvas shell, so. Okay. Um, I will get the video recording up tonight when I get home. So I think on the channel, the video recording is from last semester, so, or last year actually, because this class only runs once a year at Moreno Valley. So let's check out lab three. Um, if you're using simulator and editor uh, on your PC, you can open those. If you're using the online one, make sure you have that page open and your text editor open so you can write your program. Okay, so six o'clock, we're gonna get, get started. I think for those who are coming in a little later, they'll catch up. So today we're gonna work specifically with numbers and so you have a better understanding of how to operate numbers. Um, lab three has some instruction that also will be covered in chapter five but so i wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background knowledge before you start writing your code so you can understand what why we're doing certain things um and i don't normally use um slide show or presentations because i think they're just dry but this is going to give you a little bit of information and it's helpful. So when you're subtracting uh, values, um, any value, and mostly we're going to work with hexadecimal number. In LC3, we are subtracting using the add uh, instruction and the not instruction. So on this slide, it gives you a little bit of 
example on how to use subtraction, okay? So when you subtract, for example, we want to subtract values that's in register one and register two, right? We take register one, we subtract register two. Then we're gonna store it, the result in register three. So the way that you write that will be, um, you have to do a not and an add and the output, the result. So first you are going, you're subtracting register two. So you have to flip the bits or use the not operator, right? We talked about that when we talked about two's complement. So basically when you subtract, you add the two's complement. So you take register two and you not it. That's the one's complement. And then after that, we have to add the one bit to hold the sign. So we would then take whatever that we not, we're gonna add the one. And then after that, you, at this point, you would have the two's complement of register two. So then you are going to take that and you're gonna add it with register one. So that way it means that you're taking register one, subtract register two, and we're gonna store it in register three. Now, if, in the case where if you or, right, you can use the, Mor the Morgan's law, which comes back to the prior week uh, lecture, you will have to not register one, not register two, and then add them together or add them together because when you have the NAN, it's equivalent to what you would see with on this side. And then after you end them together, you would store that in register three, and then you are going to apply the not. So when you're using the Morgans, as you can see, you have to, it's probably about four lines compared to if we're using two's complement, it will be three lines. So it saves a little bit of time when you're doing two's complement for subtraction compared to if you are applying the Morgan's law, but you have to work with the or. Um, and now we worked on how to copy register before and just to recall, right? You, when you take the register and you add it with zero and you put it onto a different register simply, that's a way that you can copy value from one register to another. So you simply take that register, add it with zero and then store it onto another register. That's how you copy. And then when you initialize at zero, you simply end it with zero. And we see that when we clear it, right? So when I put the comment clear, basically that's the end. Now today we are going to work with LDI and LDI is something that was added later on for LC3. Um, it is a way to move data. So it is part of the data movement instructions. But LDI is a way that we can load indirect mode and we'll expand on this more next week again, right? As the same to store. So when you load a, a value to a register, later on in your program, you have to store from that register. So if I take a value and I put it into the register, which is temporary, right? And I do something with that, then later on in my program, I have to be able to bring the calculation and then store it back. So if you do a load, you have to later on store. So when you load, it's gonna read the data memory to the register. So it's gonna take the data and put it to the register. Now, how is LDI different than the LD? Well, LD is a PC relative mode. So it's gonna bring that into the PC compared to the LDI, it's not, okay? And I'm gonna give you the diagram that you're gonna see shortly. Same thing with ST compared to STI. So ST is a PC relative mode compared to STI that is indirect mode. So the I stands for indirect. So you basically store it indirectly. And so when you store, what does that mean? You're gonna take the data from the register that you've been calculating and you're gonna put it back into the memory. So when we load, we bring it from the memory to the register. And when we store, we take the data from the register and we put it onto the memory. 
And in assembly, that's what you normally do is you work directly or indirectly with the memory, depending on your instructions. Last week, we used LEA, which is a PC relative mode, and but it does not access memory. So it is slightly different than the other load, right? So LEA stands for Load Effective Address. It, what it does is it compute the address and it's saved in the register. So it is slightly different than the other one where the other loads actually read the data from the memory and put it onto the register, okay? So um, now we added the new term PC relative mode. And so this is gonna be for the address of 256 words of the instructions, but for the rest of the memory, we are going to um, load to a certain address. And again, I will revisit this when we, we practice a little bit more on how we would use instruction. So when you do an LDI, what does that mean, right? So LDI, the first four bits that for the opcode it's gonna be 1010, okay? And we talked about the add last time when we met. So when you load, you're gonna do an LDI, and in this case, indirect. The next part of your instruction should be the destination where you're loading it to, okay? And then the rest is gonna be the PC offset. So when that, when that happens, right, you are going to, instead of bringing it to the PC, like what we normally do with the regular load, right? It's gonna pull it from the memory location, okay? And then the address of that is gonna go into the MAR, and then the data of that is gonna go to the MDR. So when you load, it's gonna bring in the, from the memory location, address is gonna go to the MAR, the data is going to go to the MDR, okay? Now, the, the ALU, it's going to be able to use that to be able to put that onto the register, which is your destination. So if I say LDI R0 and the operands, then it's going to take that and put it onto R0. But within the process, you would see that these components are in the works and it's pulling that from the memory, okay? So now it, it won't copy that to the PC compared to the PC relative mode in the other instructions, then it's gonna be able to copy the, the uh, address value onto the PC. So it's slightly different, but ultimately when you load, you're moving, right, the data and you're still gonna be able to achieve the same thing. Now think about how you're using memory and how, how efficient you want to use the memory. That's what's important in how we look at assembly and we write a certain instruction. So I wanna give you a little bit of background so that way when you're using an LDI, right, you understand what that's doing. And um, when you're using an STI, what, what is it doing? Now STI is the opposite way, right? you're still, so after you compute, you have to take that value from the register and you're gonna bring it back into the memory. So when that happens, the data is gonna pull from the register file, your R1, R2, R3, et cetera, and put it onto the MDR, okay? Then the address is gonna compute and it's gonna put it onto the MER. And then from there, it's going to bring it to the memory location and the data is going to store into the memory. Okay, so when you load, you move the data to the register. When you store, you take the data from the register and put it onto memory. Okay, any question? All right, so I'll come back to this chapter five next week, um, but we want to have a little bit of background right now. So in this lab, we are going to do some arithmetic instructions because we will continue to do this, but more advanced in the next few weeks. 
So we will start with simple subtraction. Okay. So in this program, what we're doing is we're taking the variable P and we're going to subtract the variable Q. Okay. So we're going to take P minus Q and we have to understand how to write it in assembly. It's really simple, right? P could be any value and Q could be any value and you can test it, okay? So like any LC3 program, you are going to start with origination address, dot .org hex 3000. So when you load your program, that's the part of the memory where your program will begin. So that will be your first line. And you can add the comments accordingly to help you understand each step. That will be fine. Okay. Then the next part we are going to load. And here we are going to load P to register three. And P is a label. Okay. LDI is the memory to the register. Yes, that's correct, Ethan. That is correct. So um, after we load the label P to register three, we got to do the same thing to Q, okay? So we're going to take Q and we're going to load that to register four, okay? I cannot use register three because I already use it for another label. So two separate label, you have to use two separate register. Okay, now we are going to fill down here. So we're gonna give them the addresses, right? So basically we're associating a label to a memory location, and then we're gonna load that onto register three. So when you set a value for P, let's say that my P is hex two and my Q is hex one, two minus one should give me a one, right? But so in that case, it's gonna take that value two for P from this address and bring it to the register. And then my hex one from the Q address and bring it to the register. And that's how it works. And then after that, after we load, we got to make Q to be two's complement because we're subtracting Q. So since Q is loaded to register four, we have to find the one's complement, which is where we would take R4, right? Not it, and then put it onto register two. Now, can I use register four again? I sure can. I can. But in this case, I show you here that you can put it onto register two. So I not R4, I flip the bits in R4 and I put that onto register two, okay? Then after we have the ones complement, the next line is to add the one to hold the sign. And you can add hex one or decimal one, it's the same, okay? So, then because not R4 is in register two, we would take register two, add it with the one, and then put it back into register two. So at this point, when you add that one, what you have is the negative Q, okay? After we have the negative Q, then we're gonna take the negative Q add it with the P. So negative Q, add it with P, and then put that, put the result on register one. So if I have P is two and Q is one, right? When it subtract, it should have a one on register one, but I'm not done. I have to bring the result. Remember register is temporary. If you leave it there, nothing's gonna happen, right? So you have to take that value from the register and put it back into the memory. So that way, you know, if you, you know, if you do wanna output, then you have to put it into zero and then convert it and so on. We're not outputting on console this time. 
we're just going to have the result from register one and then store it to a label. So when you do an STI here, you take the result from register one and you store it to the label. And for the label, we are going to put an address to it. Okay, so you put it back into the memory. Okay. And then after that, this is your data section. You are going to fill the P and you can use addresses that are, you know, you can do 3,100, 30, but not too far down, like I said before. So P, we're going to fill it at 3,120. Q, we're going to fill it at 3,121. Now, if you have a lot of lines of code, when you look at the simulator, you should look at the address for each of the word where that's located. You don't want to fill an address that's going to overlap your instruction, right? So we want to fill it a little bit further down. So P is going to be at 3120. Q is going to be 3121. And then the minus, which is our result after subtraction, that's going to be 3122. And then we're going to end. Okay, so before that, we have the halt, so it's stop execution. So when you put in your program, and I commented here so you can see, we load indirect to P, P to R, R3, we load indirect to R4. Then we find the two's complement so we can subtract Q. So when we not Q, and at the one, basically we have a negative R4 or negative Q. And then your register one, when we add it and put it to the register one, so R1 is gonna be equal to P minus Q. And then after we have the, the result from the subtraction, we wanna store it back to a label that has an address, so we store the result from register one to minus. And then we stop execution. And then we fill the label, that's your data section, and we end the program. Okay, any question? I have a good question, Professor. Mm -hmm. um, where the add section, the hash one, is that a literal one we're adding? It is a decimal one. Oh, decimal you can one. use, yeah, so here I can use a decimal one or a hex one, right? Um, recommended you use hex, but I, you know, either way, it's still okay. Because uh, a decimal one is the is equivalent to a hex one. Okay, all right. Other questions? So if you're using an online simulator, right, use text editor, write out your program, save it as a .asm file, and then you're gonna upload that .asm file when you assemble. And then when you run, right, you can use the same, the same web page there but you have to assemble before you run. And for those of you who are using the application, right, after we write out these lines, we're gonna go file, save as, and I simply save it as lab3ex1, or you can refer to the lab and ask you to save it as a certain file name. It doesn't really matter. I see a chat question. Okay, no problem. So we would save it as a dot ASM. Make sure we do that because it's assembly. And then after we saved it, we are going to assemble it. You can click this ASM button or translate a assemble. So when it assembles, it's going to give you the object file, which is what you need to simulate. Then when if we're using the application, we are going to 
bring up our simulator that's on your in your LC3 folder on your C drive if you install it on your PC. Then you're gonna load the program by clicking this or file load program, same. And whatever you saved it <coughs> and assemble it as, you're gonna select that. So as soon as you load it, you can see your program start with the blue arrow right? You see each of the instruction that you wrote on your program. That's what the simulator is designed to do. Now, when you look at each of the instruction, this is 16 bit, one word, one word, one word, right? Each of these have address. So if your program starts here, that's the first line, right? Your LDI and so on. Okay. And then your label, your labels go where you told it to go, right? Now, when you fill, it doesn't put the address. It, it fills it with the hexadecimal value. So when you fill, you see how you fill 3120, right? So it puts that hex value to the label P, but there's the address, okay? Why is it doing that? Because when we subtract, right, we, it would use a value, right, at a location, and then it would add it accordingly and, and give us the result. Now, when we fill, right, because it's a pseudo uh, op code, we, it actually is a store R0 with a, a value in the back. All right. So once we have these, this program loaded, you are gonna run, okay? Now, since I'm not outputting anything, how do I know this is correct, right? So there are features on the simulator for you to set value, okay? Now, so let's go back. I'm gonna rewind a little bit. Let me reinitialize the machine, Re oh, reload this. So before you run, if you wanna test your program, you need to set the value. So let's say that I want to make P hex four and I wanna make Q hex two, right? Four minus two. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to click this button called set value, or you can click simulate set value, same thing, okay? And I know that for Q, you see how that's the location, right? So right now it is at it is at 3121. So when I take this value, subtract the other one, right? That's one difference. But I can also put in a specific value that I want to fill. Okay. So let's say I do a um, Q is two, I said. Okay. And then P is four. Okay. So as it leaves your program, right? Uh, there was a return instructions because it, it finished out. Right, you're always going to have a minus one with the R1. And after you run the program, you would always notice that. Okay. Now, when you, sorry, I typed in that wrong there. When you come back to your program by going to the jump to, right? This was the original program or before we ran was at text 3000. After it ran, you notice that I, it, it is gonna store my value here in minus, okay? So your result is gonna be at hex uh, 3122 as we told it that it would be here, okay?
So here's the lab. I want you to screenshot your code and your simulator after the program is ran. In the result, if we don't set this, let me reload mine and run it. Let me check. Okay, it ran fine. And we're gonna jump back to 3000. Okay. If you don't set any value, right, this is how your program ran. It fills it at 30, 20, 3120, like we told it. It fills it, it fills this at 3121. And then for the minus, it's gonna be 3122. Now this negative one, because the PC is already executed all your instructions, it's gonna move back one. So that way it's done with your program. There's no more instruction left, okay? Now on the lab, it asks you, why is the LDI instruction used to load the values P and Q? Because the P is filled at a certain value, right, 31 to zero, and the Q is filled with hex 31 to one. We have to, to bring the data in from the memory to the register to operate because only the register can operate. And then why do we store out at the end? Well, the result is from the register, which is register one, we have to put it back into the memory so we can access it later, okay? Because if you don't, right, all of this is either clear out or go away. So register doesn't hold permanent values. So when you load, you store. If you start out with store, you load at the end. And we will have that practice as well. Don't worry about setting value right now. Next lab, we're gonna do that. So I want you to be a little bit more familiar with like how to fill and how to use your memory addresses and label. So what register was used to store the result, right? When you read the program, you should see it. At the end, we store it from register one. Where am I supposed to save this? The program, you save it to any folder you want, okay? If you have a folder on your desktop for this class, you can save it there. So for me, right, I save my program to my desktop folder called CIS 11. So you can make a folder and you can save all your lab program for assembly there. Okay, so when you load it, so did you save it as an ASM? So make sure that you save it like this. Okay. So that means that you're not you're not looking at the right location. So if you save it accordingly, when you load your program, right? You're gonna go to that folder. See how I have a folder called Lab Three Spring Twenty One, right? Because I modified the lab since before. So I just make sure that I click the arrow down and go to the right folder. So if you save it to like a folder on your desktop, click on your desktop and find that folder. Okay. Or if you put it on your C drive, so make sure that you find it because if you don't find it, that just, okay. So it should be, oh, if, did you assemble it? So if you didn't assemble it, that's why it's not showing up. Okay, so make sure that when you work with the editor, 
So file save as, right? And I'm going to save it as this. Make sure I'm in the right folder. Click save. Then I'm going to assemble. Click ASM. Okay, so assemble. Okay, make sure we have no errors. And then you are going to take the simulator and then load it, find the program that was assembled, click open, and then run. Any questions regarding subtraction, fill, uh, exercise one? Okay, so from this point on, we should know how to subtract because we are going to do a division program, okay, where we have to apply subtraction operation. Okay, so pay attention to how the program flow right, which register is storing the result, how you're able to subtract. And then you can always jump to the program to look at your label and the finished program that's ran. I think I typed the comment here wrong. That should be a Q. All right. So we got exercise one. We answer the questions. Look at your simulator. And remember we talked about why we're loading those and storing them. So Tyler asked you, so when P and Q are added, once the program ends the result, anywhere to be seen is gone. Your result is it. it stores back to the memory. So when I look at the program, Tyler, right? This is my program after it ran, my results here, it stores back into the memory. Okay. So we can also take the calculator and remember that we initialize, we fill these, right? The P is 3120. So hex. And then you can subtract X 3121. Okay. So this, right, is the result of that is here. It's going to be minus in the minus location. Because that will be equal to negative 1 because when we do hex 3121, subtract hex 3122, you get a negative 1 and it's gonna store that into the minus location. Because after it subtract, after we add it, we got the, the value that was subtracted that was in register one. 
And we take that value and we put it onto a label, which is in the memory location. It still said 3122 when I made the PQ. Yeah, so all that is, is it's going to fill this part. Okay. And on here, okay. So when you store that, right? On here, if you set it right here like this, so let's try setting it again. So let me see if, let's set, um, Two. Let me reload it. Hold on one second. You're going to load it. You're going to set it before you run it. So let's do so I'm going to do one, two, zero. And if we set it at three. Okay, let's set the queue. Subtract so one, we should get a two. Yeah, it's always going to be this right here. But in the next lap, we're gonna we're gonna do one that that we're gonna subtract that it's gonna actually give you the the minus result. Okay, so when you set P and Q, it's always because you feel it at this location, it's always gonna be there and its address is actually this, right? But what it is is it's gonna take this fill value, subtract this fill value. And then and it's going to be added to this, but it's going to do a plus one as it jumps to the next address. So I will let you test it in the next lab for the set value. OK, so what I want to achieve in this lab is to show you how you can do a subtraction. And then how you can fill the addresses for your label. But your results should be here. So earlier, you saw that I took three. I subtract one, right? P is three and Q is one. And as I ran the program, that's my result. It's going to put it on the value that you fill for the address, hex 3122. See that, Tyler? So if you jump to the actual fill as an address, you will find it. You will find your result. And we will work more on this. So just to capture, Tyler asked me, well, when I look at my program, I had the same address and it's not showing me anything here. You won't see anything here, okay? So when you set a value, so what I did was I load my program, okay? I set a value before I run. So I set the value. Notice that my P is 3120, so location hex 3120, and this is how you can test. So let's say that I want my P to be four. So hex four, hexadecimal four, apply okay. Then I'm going to set the second value, which is my Q. And my Q is at hex 3121. So hex 3121 is the location because I fill it there, right? And let's say I want to, for it to subtract 2 for Q, 4 minus 2, right? OK. After I set those two value, I'm going to run the program. Now, I won't see anything at hex. 3000, it's the same program, right? What I need to do is I need to go to 
the fill location. Hex 3, 1, 2, 0. So I set my P as 4, my Q as 2. For subtract 2, I have a hex 2. And my program worked. Okay, and you can test that out yourself. You have to do a little bit of jump too because now we have to go look for it in the memory. The machine doesn't output onto console unless we tell it to output to console, right? Which is a few more lines, but here you can see that it gives me the result. Any question? Okay, so now let's go back to our lab. Now we have to create another program and this time we're gonna use X, Y, and Z as variable, but we're gonna subtract Z. So this is a, out the equation that you're given. Yeah, so it's really physical and where you're gonna look for things in memory, okay? So if you didn't get that, stay a little bit later after the class and I will explain it again to you. So for number two, we are gonna make an assembly program using the concept that we just learned how to subtract. And this is the equation, X is equal to Y plus one minus Z. And we have to fill X at 32.25. Z and Y can be, and I normally fill if X is here, I would fill it in the adjacent slot. So 31 to six or 31 to, you know, so you want to be consecutive. So it's easy to find, okay? You need to take a screenshot of your code and your simulator, okay? We need to look at the location, right? Looking at your SD and L, L, ST and so on. So. I didn't give you the code for this, but I'm gonna walk you through that here, okay? Uh, I think you guys can see my... Okay. So at the top, I comment uh, my labs and the location. It just helped me when I wrote the code. Like the other program, I'm gonna originate at hex 3000. And we would start with clearing our register. Okay, so I'm gonna and R1, R1 hex zero. So I'm gonna clear R1. We initialize the R1 register one at zero. And since I'm working with register two, I'm gonna clear that too. So we're gonna initialize register two at zero. So basically that just means that R2 is equal to zero and R1 is equal to zero at this point. And we recall that we have three variables. So we need to load two. The two that we need to load is gonna be the y and the z right and then we're going to store out x okay so just like the other one right we need to load the variable that we're working with so we are going to load y to register one because we just clear it so load indirect y to register one now I need to operate y plus one. After I load y, I have to add it with the one. And you can add it with a hex or a decimal one, it's the same. But since I'm sticking with the equation, I'm gonna add the decimal one. So after I load y, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna do add r1, r1, and a decimal one. So what we're doing, we're gonna take the decimal one, add it with Y, which is in R1, and then put it back into register one. So register one is gonna hold R1 plus, or uh, I'm sorry, Y plus one. Okay. 
Anybody got that? Any question? So I just took care of this, right? With those lines, these two. The next, we got to manage the Z. So we don't have a Z yet, so we need to load Z. It's like declaring a variable, right? Z to register to. So we load Z to register. And at this point, register to have nothing right, because we cleared it earlier here. So we're going to load Z to register two. And we're doing indirect load. But we have to subtract Z, so we need to do the two's complement with it, right? So after we load Z to register two, we're going to knot it. So we're going to knot R2 and then put it back to the register two. So that will give you the ones complement. And then after you have the ones complement, you are going to take register two, which has the not value, and then add it with the one. So register two plus one, because the one holds the sign, and put it back into register two. So by this point, your register two has negative Z. So, so far we only have the Y plus one and the negative Z. Now we got to combine them together, okay? So, the next line, we're going to take our register one, which is the Y plus one, add it with register two, which is negative Z, to give you the result in register two. So here, your register two is Y plus one minus Z. Now the equation calls for X is equal to Y plus one minus Z. So you have to store X because X is storing the result, right? So our result where we add them is in register two. So we're gonna take that value from the register and store it to a label called X. So you're gonna do an STI R2 X put or store the result in X. I wanna get away from using pseudo instruction there. So store result in X is good. Then we're gonna stop execution. Now to the data section. So that means that we have to fill X and the, the, the question number two told us to fill X at hex 3225. And you can make like Y at two, 3226 and Z at hex 3227. Doesn't you can skip to, but you want to be close together so you can find them. So put them next to each other. And then we're going to do a dot in. So after I have done this, I'm going to go ahead and click save as, right? And we're going to call it lab3exercise2.asm. Make sure we're in, put it in the right folder. And then we are gonna assemble. Make sure we don't have any errors. If you have any errors, just check your code. If you're missing a comma or something, it's gonna throw an error. Then after we have assembled our program, we're gonna open up our simulator. I normally reinitialize the machine. 
So clear everything out, then load the second program. And if you want to test values, right, you can set it. Just go set it like at the location that you fill and then give it a value that you want. Okay, so if I want to set Y, I would go to the value that I fill, 226, and then, you know, give it a value, hex 5 or whatever. And then set the second value. And then we're going to run. And then you can jump. Now, since we fill later on further down, you can jump to that. Here's my set value, right? Here it is when it subtract. And then, the, and then the X is here. So my result is above it. Any question? So let's go back to the program so we can answer some question. So here you can see your data, right? The register that we worked with. Um, now, sometimes you would see some value that remains there, but don't rely on the register value to be able to get the result. It's really to the memory that you have to see, okay? So in, in the question, it asks you, after the program is ran, identify the value and the locations of the register to load and store up the data. So look at your simulator, right? At the end of the program, so your, your loaded values, when you load, you, you load to register one and register two. And when you store, you store from register two, okay? Now the location where your result would be, that will be X, which is at hex 30, what was it? 32 to X or whatever. So in my case, it was at 32 to seven, or I'm sorry, five. That's where it's gonna be. In that store from and then when you load it, you load it at load to R one two from hex. Three, two, two, six, and hex. So if I look at my code, it shows that, right? My Y and my Z is what I fill. So you can check your arithmetic. If it works, your program works by setting the value. You don't have to, I didn't require it for this lab. We'll do a ne the next lab, we'll do some of that. But for those of you who want to know like, oh, did this program work? Yeah, you can set the value like I showed you before you run it. And the way you use the location is your fill value. 
in your program. Then you can jump to it to see. Question? So with this, you can see that we really look at the low level from the memory. Right, we see, we put, we put things back into the memory, we pull it from the memory, use it, and then put it back. Now, sometimes you would store from the memory, and then you would, or sometimes you would restore. We would work on that when we do recursion. Because in recursion, you have to store and restore. Okay. Any question with two? Okay. So after we tackle two, three is a piece of cake. It's just more variables and the equation is just a little longer. Right, but it's still just adding and subtracting. So really simple. So doing this, you can start seeing, okay, um, I should work inside out because just like math, right? You want to handle it, what's inside the parentheses first and then work its way out and then store it back into T. And it already gave you the location here, okay? So I am going to open my next one. Oh, did I do three? I might not do, I might not have it, hold on. I can write it with you, but I thought I did. One second. I wrote it in Word so they could see. I remember doing this. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit, okay? Okay, so, uh, what is it? Well, maybe not. This is exercise four. I'll do it with you right now, or three. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to do a few things for our program, right? Uh, let me copy this. PX3. Okay, so what I normally do is I would start with dot .org, right, hex 3000, okay, and we want to do a few things. We have three variables, A, B, and C, okay, so we are going to do an LDI, right, um, let's do register one. Uh, yeah, and that's gonna be A, okay? Then LDI, register two, S, B. And then we simply do an add, and we're gonna put it back into R1, R1, R2, okay? So here, what I'm doing is I load, label A to R1. So R1 has A.
And for the next one, same thing, I load label B to R2. You can clear the register if you like. So R2 have B. Then here is where I would have R1 is equal to R is A plus B. And that was because we have to handle this right here, right? So that one's easy, okay? Then the next one, we're gonna take this and then we're gonna handle this, okay? So now we can load um, R3 with C. So load label C to R3. So R3 now have C. Now, remember that we have to do the two's complement of nine, okay? So if you want to do this, you can do add R4, R4 with a, we can do a decimal nine. So here, R4 is equal to nine, positive nine. Now we gotta make it negative, right? So we need to not R4, right, R4. So here we would have the ones complement of R4. Then we are gonna take that and we're gonna add it with the one to make it the twos complement. So add R4, R4, and we can do a hex one or a decimal one. So here we would have the twos complement of R4, or at this point, R4 is equal to negative nine. So we're not done, right? We got the negative nine and we got C and we gotta put them together. So next we are gonna do an add. R4 is equal, oh, sorry, I'm thinking of the comment. Uh, R4 with R3. So here R4 is C minus nine. Put the parentheses, so. Are we okay with this? Any question? Now, so now we have two piece, the C minus nine and the A plus B. Okay, now we gotta put them together. So we are gonna do an add and I can use R4 since it's last used. We're gonna take R1 and add it uh, R4 and add it with R1 and put it back into R4. So R4 is equal to A plus B plus C minus nine. Now, after we combine everything and have the complete equation, right, we're gonna store it to T. So here is where you're gonna do an STI, right? R4 with T. And we have to go to the data fill now. Okay. So we have to fill A, B, C, and T. So A dot fill. Hex, what was it? 
3102 and subsequent, right? And B dot fill hex 3103 and C dot fill hex 3104 and then lastly your fill for T is hex 3105. And I forgot to halt here. And then we can't forget the dot n. We're done. Let me see. I'll save as. Three x four three dot ASM. No error, we're good. Okay. Easy peasy, right? Take a few minutes. So once I have it saved and assembled, I open up my simulator. Right, I'm going to reinitialize, open, open up EX3, run, or set value and run. So if you want to set value, you can just click set value button. Right, so I wanted to go to A, so hex 3102, and then let's give it like a one, so a hex one, make it easy on yourself, right? And then for the next one, set it at the next location for B, and we can make it a two. And then on the next one is C, you can set it at four. And so let's make this a nine. And then, okay. And then we run and we jump to. That's your result. Any question? What did you store C as again? Was that nine? Uh, I set, yeah, I set C as nine. So nine minus nine is zero, right? One plus two is three. So I got three, that's correct. Yeah, so it's store out from register four to T and T holds three. So take a look at your simulator and answer the second question after you screenshot. Any question? All right, we, we have some time to tackle the big program. <laughs> Actually, no, we have to do number four and then the number five, so we have time. Any question on this? After you get a hang of it, it's, it's, it gets easier, okay? So I know it's only been a few weeks in, but 
you can practice. You should practice. Okay, so determine the location for T. We already, you, it, it should be the fill location for T. When you fill it with this, right, your T is here. That's where you're gonna go on your simulator to see it, see? 3105, that's my result. I said A is one, B is two, and C is nine. Nine minus nine is zero, one plus two is three. Okay, four is a little harder. <laughs> um, because, and I put a note on your lab that when you, when you work with the hexadecimal 4D, okay, you're gonna have to add it twice because it's larger than your five bits, right? Recall in our lecture that your upper end is going to be that five bits at the end. And this is going to make it eight bits. So you have an overflow. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to handle adding the four separately and then adding the D separately. Okay. I wrote this one last year, so I'll just open it up. You don't have to wait for me to write it. But um, let me. Okay. I did do this one already. Sorry, I changed some stuff since then, but let me get the right one open for you. This is the X4. This is the big one. Well, maybe I have to write that one too. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a while. So, all right, let's do it. <clears throat> Not that. Yeah, I did do this one in Word instead, but here. I'll go through this and so you can you can see and, and I can put this into um into the editor and we can build it. So in question four, it asks you this, okay? Um you have the following requirement. You have P is equal to Q, is equal to S, is equal to Z. And Z, you're going to take that, you're going to plus it, you're going to add it with hex 4D. <clears throat> okay. So that's really easy because all you have to do is work on this and then copy this to X, to S, to Q, to P. Okay. Very easy. It's actually easier than the other one. All right. So now let's come back to the program. Okay, so here's exercise four. This is what we have to do, okay? So we're gonna start our program with the address, right? Origination address, hex 3000. And on this one, I load, I use a regular load instead of the LDI. I load P to register zero. So load label P to register zero. Then on the next step, I load Q. So that's here. I load Q on the next one to register one. Okay. And I want to make these the same. So I simply copy them. I do an add R1 
R0 with the decimal zero or hex zero. You can do a hex zero here, it's the same. So when you do that, you basically copy, right, P to, to R1. So that will be making it equal. So you would do an add R1, R0 with the hex zero. So at register one, you would have P, which is equal to Q. Then we are gonna load S to register two. Next part. Okay. Then after we have S's, at register two, we would do the same thing to copy, just like the last one. You can use decimal or hex. So then we're gonna add, right? The register one, which has P and which is equal to Q with the zero, you're gonna add that with the zero. And so you copy it to register two. So R2 is P equal to Q equal to S. Now, can you do this later? Sure, right? Uh, some students, I've seen this done where they handle the Z first and then they just copy it to the rest and that's fine. I just decided to go from left to right so it's easy for me to tackle that, that equation. So next, we're gonna handle the Z. So we are gonna load Z to register three, the label Z. And then just like the other one, we're gonna recopy. So we're gonna add register two, which has these. And then with zero and put it onto register three, which is C. So that will give you Z is equal to S equal to Q equal to P. So if you decided to add four and D at this point, you can do it two times, okay? I'm gonna show you this way and then I will, I will come back to how you can do it two times. Just do two adds, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and load another label called hex 4D to register four and I'm gonna fill it just like how you did with ASCII. Okay, so hex 4D is a label and I'm gonna load it to register four. And here is where we're gonna combine it. So we're gonna do add, register four, register four, register three. Now we cannot have it out here. So we're gonna do a halt. Because if you want an out there, you have to take this and copy it to register zero and then out. Okay. Now, instead of using these two, what can I do, right? Here, if I have the Z already, okay. I'm gonna highlight this, that's one option, okay? Now the downside of this is if you output, it's only gonna show one digit because this, when you add, there's only five bits and this is eight bits right here. So you need to make sure that you extend it 
so that way it will fit. But you can also add it this way. You can do an add R3, um, R3 with a hex four. So at this point, it will be Yeah. So at this point, that will be a uh, R3 is equal to Z plus four, hex four. Now, if you wanted to add the D, right, you just saw that I checked the calculator. So if you add the four already, you cannot just add the D, right? You have to add the hex 49 to it to make it a 4D, okay? Because it's the, it has two digits. So if you just add like four plus D, that's only 11, okay? It won't be 4D. So if it's 4D, you can take 4 plus hex 49. That gives you 4D. So the, the easiest way is to do it with the label like this. Or you can do two lines where you would do add R3, R3, and then hex 49. Okay, that will be the option. Okay. I'll put it below, so that will be another way. Okay, so that's one way and that's another way. So you, the, the, a lot of the students, they understand having the fill and then put a value to it because it's a hex value, you can, that's easy, you can do that. But if you choose to use the arithmetic way, you have to add it two times or even three times in some cases where you have to fit it because when you, when you add it with only, you know, it won't fill the two digits. So if 49 is too large, it throws an error, then you have to reduce it down where you have to take two numbers separately, okay? I don't think, I think you have to make it three times even, but do it this way. So fill, when we're gonna fill P, 3002, we're going to fill Q, or you can even do like this. So after you have your data, right, you just have a dot in. So overall, your program would look like, I'm trying to show everything, so hold on. Too small, I think. Okay. 
like that. Let me see if I can increase the size. <clears throat> now, if you did it in Word and you copy it over to the editor, what happens is it's not going to translate the symbol because of the encoding. So just do it in your text editor. It's like the best and save it and then assemble it and then simulate it. Okay. Question. Are we clear on how we get the copy from one register to another to make sure that we get the equal for the variables? Okay, you just add it with the zero, anything, or I'm sorry, you add it with the zero. When you add it with the zero, it's the same. And this one, we didn't clear register. So if you like to write and clear register first, that's fine, that's good. Okay, so I have about 30 minutes to do the last one, which is the next exercise. So after you finish number four, right? Simulate it. Look at how that compares to the to addresses and execution. You can test it with the value if you want or multiple values. Okay, so in this next exercise, we're going to talk about branching because we are going to do conditional statement in this. Um, I think I touched on it in the lecture briefly. We're going to keep coming back to this <clears throat> in, the, in all the subsequent lab in our future labs um, as you are going to be doing loops and you are going to be doing, you know, if and this and if. Okay. So branch is a way that we can control the way the program flow. So BR is an instruction for branching. And we would branch it to a label, okay? We don't branch it to a register, we branch to a label. And the condition that we can branch is based on negative, okay? so. If your register store a negative value, and if you say BRN, it's gonna branch. Now, if your register store a positive value, and if you say BRN, it's not gonna branch, okay? So it's gonna branch based on the flag, which is the, the flag here, the condition, whether it's negative, zero, or positive. Okay, so you have to think about the previous line, what value it is at that register. You're also going to use an instruction called return. Okay. And just like a function, we can return from the function a certain value, right? That's the whole point in using a function is to return. 
So you can have a function to calculate sum and retard, right? So we, we apply the same concept here. You are gonna return. And for that subroutine and think of subroutine as a function, and it's gonna use register seven. Register seven, that's the last register in the group. So that's gonna be your base address. The value in register seven, that's gonna be the base address. So when you return, it's really equivalent to jump to R7, okay? So it's gonna jump to R7, it's gonna have the address of that return value and that's how it's able to get it. So when in C++ or C, when you write a function and you told it to return a value, the compiler does this. It's gonna jump to a register which has an address where that your return value is and that's how it's going to be able to output it. Okay. Any question regarding branch, jump, or retard? And we will recover, we will cover this once again in the future. <clears throat> you are going to have a JSR in this program. You're going to see JSR. Okay. And for the JSR, it's good, it stands for jump to subroutine. So you can jump to a function or a subroutine. So this is gonna put the address of the next instruction after the JSR instruction into the register seven. So it's gonna take the address of the set next function or the subroutine and put it into register seven. And so, that way it's gonna to jump to the subroutine indicated by the label. So you would use a label to identify that function or that subroutine, okay? Now, the difference between jump, right? Um, and jump to subroutine in assembly is different than what you see in go to in C and C++ because go to doesn't have where that's coming from, it doesn't have the addresses. So on the later version of C++, they kind of, they did away with go to. Okay, so we don't use go to anymore because you know go to can let you send your pro you know the to a certain part of the code, but it's not a good practice. But on the low level, if you jump, right? you can go to that section and it ties to a label and that label is tied to a memory address. So it knows where it's going and where it's coming from. And that's important to know. So in the case where we range, if your value in the previous line, like R1, right? R1, R2 here, if you add, and if R1 is negative, okay, it's gonna branch like I said, okay? All right, so let's read this code, okay? So this program is really to compare. Like when you use comparison operator, something is greater and equal to, or greater or equal to, less than or equal to, that's what we're writing here. And in C++, we simply write like one statement. If X is greater and equal to Y, like do this, print this out, show this. Or if X is less than or equal to Y, show this, right? In C++, uh, in assembly, it's different than C++ in that we got to handle all of the other conditions uh, manually. Okay. All right. First line, origination address. And we are gonna clear a couple register that we're gonna work with. Next line, we're gonna and R1, R1, hex zero, we're gonna clear register one. And then the following line, the same thing, but we're clearing register two. We're gonna work with the label called reset and 
the reset is going to be loaded to register six. So we're going to do a load R6 reset. Okay. And it doesn't make sense at the beginning unless you look at what reset means. Okay. Reset means we are going to convert it to ASCII. Okay. So you can use another label name instead of reset, like ASCII, okay? So we're gonna offset it so we can when convert it back to text so we can see, okay? So that's what reset means. And then we are gonna do an LEAR0. So when you see this, you already know, oh, that's a string, right? So you are gonna do a load effective address to register zero line one. So we're going to prompt something. We're going to output a line. Okay, so line one to register is zero. Since we load effective address right below that, we're going to put. I use puts here and just like the first lab, right? I don't use out. Out is only going to give you one character. So we want to put for the string. And this program is going to ask the user to enter a value and put a character. So the next line is going to prompt. It's so it's going to get the get C. So it's going to wait for the character to be input. Okay. And we want to show the user what they just entered. So we're going to out. And you see here the difference between the two. Out is going to only show one character. Now, as they enter that value, you got to take that value and move it because we need another value. Okay. So, as they input that from, so for the get C, it's going to put it on register zero. We're going to take that. And we're going to add it with the R6 because we've got to convert text to ASCII and put it on register one. So we convert ASCII text to number and put it on register one. And we're going to prompt the user to enter a second number. So we're going to do an LEA R0 line two. Okay. And as we load effective address, we can output that. So puts show line two on console. And after we prompt the user to enter the, net, the second value, we are gonna use a get C to obtain that value. Read the input character. And we're going to out show them what they, they enter. Then we're going to move and convert it, right? So we're going to add R0, which is the input value, with the ASCII offset. You got to subtract there, right? And then put it on register two. That's why we clear it at the beginning. Okay, any questions so far? You can read the comment, I added it there, but I hope when I explain it, it makes more sense. Now we are going to call a function compare, call a subroutine call compare. So you're doing a JSR compare, that's basically calling compare function. You know how in the main in C++ you call the function that you define somewhere, right? Above. Well, here you are going to jump to the compare label, which has the function definition. And we're going to halt here. So now after we call the function, then we have to define what it is. 
Okay. So in the compare function, and it, you can indent it like this, or you can keep going. It's just easy sometimes to read it this way. We are going to clear register free. And we need to subtract and or treat a negative value, okay? Because ultimately what we want is we want this to be, oh, I didn't comment it. We want it to be where it can compare for a negative or a positive value, okay? So if it's subtract and it's negative value, then it's less. If it's positive value, then it's more, right? So if I take one minus two, I get a negative value, I would have a less than. If I take one minus zero and I have a positive value, then I have a greater than, okay? So I take two of the input that the user enter, and then I want to compare the value, okay? So I have to do a subtract. So after we clear the register, we're going to do the two's complement so we can subtract. I would not the register two, where did that come from? Well, register two was the second input. And after I knot the register two, I would add it with the one to make it a two's complement. So it becomes, right, negative value in register two. Then I can add it with register one to subtract. Are we clear so far? Any question? <clears throat> So after I have the two's complement for register two, I would take that and add it with register one. So basically I take the first input, subtract the second input and put the result on register three. Right? Now, if it's a negative value, I'm going to branch to, I'm going to send it to a neg label. And I would output negative value, right? So I would branch it when it's negative. That means it's less, okay? The first input is less than the second input, okay? Now I need to copy the result to register three. Why do I need to do that? Because I have to check for another condition that it's greater than, so it's positive. Because if I don't, it's not gonna be able to check from the next branch, okay? So here is where we, we put it back to register three, so that way we can check for if it's the first input is greater than the second input by branching positive. Okay. So if it's positive, then I'm gonna send it to the pos label and output positive. Now, what if it's equal? If I if the user input two and another two, I also have to handle that too, right? So again, I'm gonna copy the value from register three back into register three so I can check, okay? Now, if you subtract and if it's equal to zero, that means it's equal, both inputs are equal, then I can send it to the EQ label.
okay? Then we are going to clear register five under the EQ, right? After the EQ, we're gonna clear register five. And we're gonna add the first input with register five so we can return. Okay, so simply the, after you have set this up, then you're gonna go and get your label started. So we are gonna load effective address of register zero to N, and we're gonna fill the N with less than Y, X is less than Y. We're gonna do a put so we can output that string if, right, it is less than. So as you can see, when you branch negative here, basically you're saying if X is less than Y and in C++ it's one line, right? C out X is less than Y string. So with that, you have to branch negative after you subtract, right? And then load effective address from a string. Okay, and then it's C out or output puts then return for the positive value that's like saying if x is greater than y c out x is greater than y string so we would have pos lea r zero p puts return And then lastly, we would have EQ, which is equal LEA R zero E, and that is gonna be the string where X is equal to Y, right? Puts return. So for our data section, we need to set up the strings for N, P, and E. And then we're gonna fill the reset because the reset is gonna be your ASCII as they input its text. So you got an ASCII convert it. So we're gonna subtract it with 30. So FFD zero is the hex value for the offset in the ASCII. And if you're not sure, look at the ASCII chart. Also look at the last lab video. Now line one and line two are the prompt. So we're gonna do a strings there as well. We can say enter X and you want to do a slash N for the next line, enter Y. Otherwise it's gonna put them together and it doesn't make sense, okay? And then a dot N. So the way that you test the program, you can use the console to do this. So let me load six. And then you save your file. Okay, and then you assemble, and then you are going to simulate. So let's reinitialize the machine, load the program. And then I wanted to bring up my console. Let's do that here. Okay, and then we're gonna run. So here, let's say if we input three and Y is four and we have X is less than Y. You can test it with X is higher than Y or the same. 
So here, what we learn is that we can apply conditional statement as branches, right? And this is how we do it in assembly. Now, this is infinitely running, as you can see, right? So if you want to stop it, you can click, oop, you can click the X stop running. So can this program be improved? Sure can. But with this, you learn to write a function and we use label for that. And we're going to jump to that label and we define the function there. But in assembly, we call the function at the beginning. So think of this as the main up here, and then your function definition is down here, and then along with your data. So it's like inverted to what you've seen in C++. Okay, so this lab shows you how you can write a function, and in that function, you implement an if statement for comparison. So when you write, when you use comparison operator, right, at the low level, this is what's happening, is where it branch positive, negative, and that's how it compares. So low level instructions use this. Any question? Okay, I'm almost up to my the end of the lab session. So run the program, check it, test it with the values, okay? How would you improve this program? So think about how, right? One area we can improve because it's infinitely running, right? So probably can clean it up a little bit. How can you, how can you improve it? So think how it would be in C++ and how that can translate to assembly and do your best in telling me how you can improve the program. Every program can be improved. Any question? So we will see more branching. We will see more subtraction. At line four, while parsing the offset LD, the offset reset is not valid numerical. Is that your error? Okay. Um, Did you put this in? It's XXFD zero. Did you have a typo? Did you put an O instead of a zero? Yeah. Make sure it's numbers. It's not gonna like it if it's not the right hex number. Professor, can you run the program again? Uh, I don't think we have the same results. I put in five and five and uh, I didn't get a, a string message or anything. Yeah, I'm not getting the is equal to. So that means that you need to go and fix your EQ and your branch zero. I completely skipped the EQ section. I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, that's really easy to identify, though, because you're like, oh, how come it doesn't show equal? Well, 
If you didn't tell it to branch, it wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> I also got an error message, um, which I fixed, but um, it was for the, the negative, and I, I put in NEG all lowercase. So does capitalization matter? So then I put it in capital and it worked. Yeah. It, yeah, so some stuff is is it matters like i i recommend using like if you i've seen it done in in some lower cases but use the capital because i think the label um the way that the simulator works is it it requires that but not always in all assembly language right um so yeah use capital And also how you identify it is how you, you need to fill it exactly like that. Just like how you declare a variable in C++. If, if you put it like, let's say EQ, and then down here you put equal, then it won't know what that is, right? So we want to make sure that the identifier or the labels are the same the, um, throughout. So make sure that we do that, okay? Stick to the same throughout check for the differences if there's error. Have all the past program been running infinitely? If not, why is this one infinite? Oh, because we didn't. Uh, one is that we didn't halt at the end here. Tyler, um, in the past, we actually had the halt execution at the the end of our operation but you notice that when we branch and return the only time that we halt was like this right here but when it branched and returned it still didn't end some of the execution so this one doesn't so it's kind of like we actually have a while loop and then inside it we nested the if um, but you will see how we can actually use a while loop in the next few labs um, so we can make it better where we would halt after it returns each time. But with that, we have to go back to some of our condition and, and check. So that's the flaw with this one is that I wanted to keep reusing register three. So I didn't I didn't want to like halt after it branches each time, but it should. Okay. Yeah. Professor, when we make updates to the uh, file, do we need to reassemble? Reassemble and yeah, resave and reassemble. Anytime you resave, you have to reassemble. Okay. Yeah. So in C we we edit the program, you have to save and rerun the program, right? Same thing. So when we reassemble, we just set up for the system to just like how we set up the compiler for it to build the program. So yeah, we got to reassemble. All right, if we are finished, um, please put your name into the chat. Make sure that we get all the, let me stop share and stop recording. Make sure we have 